Hey there, I'm Perry Carpenter, one of the hosts of the Digital Folklore Podcast. Welcome to Digital Folklore Unplugged Edition. Unplugged is a new additional episode type that we're trying out. And when we say unplugged, we mean that we are stripping away much of the narrative framing and the production elements that we use in our standard episodes. And we're giving you access to very raw or only slightly edited interviews. Today's guest is Jenna Rose Nethercott. I'm Jenna Rose Nethercott. Jenna Rose is a folklorist, an author, a poet, and is also a researcher and producer for the podcast Lore. She won a National Poetry Series Award for her book, The Lumberjack's Dove, and her most recent book, Thistlefoot, is a reimagining of Baba Yaga that she somehow effortlessly weaves together with American Road Adventure, the complexity of sibling relationships, and even puppetry. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. What you are about to hear is a roughly 45-minute excerpt from our full one hour and 30 minute interview with Jenna Rose. If you're a Patreon supporter and you want to hear the additional 45 minutes, you can head over to Patreon and get access to the full interview where in addition to today's topics, you'll hear about Jenna Rose's life as a child clown, her quest to secure a bell tower to work from, what it was like to win the National Poetry Series, the writing of Thistlefoot, and more. All of that's over on Patreon. We pick up here with a discussion of folklore, urban legends, and the interesting time we find ourselves in, which is enabled by social media and other forms of mass public online expression. And if you're brand new to the Digital Folklore Podcast, that other voice that you hear in the discussion is our co-host, Mason Amadeus. Okay, let's get unplugged. When we shift gears and think about internet folklore, how do you feel like the internet has changed or enhanced what folklore is? Okay, so this is the perfect segue to talk about this thing that I was really hoping we get to talk about. Okay. Have you guys ever heard of the Gutenberg parentheses? The Gutenberg parentheses? Gutenberg parentheses. Yeah. No. Okay. Oh my gosh. Strap in. You're going to love this. Okay. So there is a a scholar named L.O. Sauerberg of the University of Southern Denmark. That is who came up with this idea. The concept of it is that um, it is, uh, it's the idea that before the invention of Gutenberg's printing press, oral communication was the predominant means of passing a- along information, right? So the folkloric process was the predominant means of communication. And what I mean by that is, you know, with oral tradition, it is multi-authored, not single-authored. It is spoken, not written down, which means that it is uh, transient, it's shifting. It is not static the way that literate culture is static. It is sort of transmitted from person to person to person, and it shifts with each new transmission. Um, All of the elements that come with folklore and that come with oral tradition. That was the way most information and storytelling functioned before the printing press. With the invention of the printing press, literate culture took over as being the predominant culture-making sort of style, I guess. So suddenly, the predominant means of communication became uh, static, written, single-authored, and literate, which is all totally different than an oral process. Mm -hmm. Now, that remained the case. Up until da, 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 the internet. So now that the internet is in full swing, suddenly we have gone back to a much more uh, oral style process of communication where we get our information from multiple authors. Like it's gone to the people instead of to sort of like the elites that have this control and gatekeep of the information. Uh, it is like constantly shifting. It is like contributed to by many different people, many different sources. You know, that's how something like Slender Man comes to be is like, you've got, you know, all these different contributors that create the story as well as just the way we get our news, you know, like, I mean, I'm not proud of it, but I feel like I get most of my news by like coalescing all the tweets I read, you know, and I think many of us can say that. And so essentially, for the first time since before the invention of the printing press, 
the folkloric process has once again become the predominant means of communication. And the printing press just kind of interrupted that process that we have now returned to. However, the main difference between the original oral tradition and the internet version of that is, well, two things. One is it is incredibly expedited right? So something that would have taken years to travel around the world, centuries even, a story to travel around the world now takes a matter of seconds. And you see, I mean, with meme culture, a meme goes in and out of style in a matter of hours or days. Um, So it's super expedited. And two, there is kind of a paper trail. We can go back and find the very first Slender Man piece and find a single author who created it. So it's become this sort of hybridity between literate culture and oral culture with a a bit of a lean toward the oral again. So that is the Gutenberg parenthesis. That is such a, it's, so this is something that we've talked about a fair amount with different people Mm -hmm. that, that we've been interviewing, but I don't think it's ever quite been put in that context. And that is really a lot to chew on and think about. Yeah, You know, when you, when you get to that, just getting to the the purity, I think of human expression in you know, in groups, um, and then also having that paper trail. There's also the the other thing that comes with the internet, which is, and I have a cybersecurity background. So in cybersecurity, you think about three things all the time: confidentiality, integrity of information, and availability of information. Um, that integrity piece can be shifted around, right? I can still potentially go back and shift some bits and bytes and leave a false paper trail if I want to, or I can, um, if archive.org isn't as good as it should be, sometimes I I might lose some things. So I really like the the Gutenberg parentheses, but I wonder if maybe as folklorists, there should be some dedicated effort to additional preservation techniques so that some of those pieces that could go uh, wrong with integrity and availability could potentially be rectified. Sure. And I mean, I think it's sort of that same paradox that folklore collectors were grappling with in terms of collecting oral tradition, which is as soon as you do collect those pieces and make them static, they are no yeah. longer folk. They are no longer in the form that made them folklore because you've brought them mm. over into uh, a literate form. But yeah, yeah, I think it's the same. I think that there is this, you know, there was this real movement to collect and preserve oral tradition. And I imagine that there will be a very similar movement to collect and preserve internet culture in the same way. And I know that like, you know, at University of Indiana, Bloomington, for example, where they have one of the world's leading folklore uh, graduate programs, a number of the students in that program are studying internet culture as their like folklore master's thesis. So I think there's already movement to try and preserve these things. But I do also think that the very nature of a of a folkloric uh, anything is that it's impossible to preserve all of it because there are infinite uh, mutations of it. There are infinite mm-hmm. infinite uh, like versions of every piece of information, and that's what makes it what it is. I think it's an interesting byproduct of the hybridity of it that it is both static and. You know, a lot of the times text based and has a paper trail and also very changing that it's like that. And there is a lot of archiving effort going on already in in a way that is kind of folklore, like a lot of open source um, efforts to archive and save and preserve. Uh, there's the big ones like Know Your Meme and Internet Archive. But then there's also all sorts of whatever micro community you're in, you'll find people stashing away things on yeah. Google Drives and like passing around links to stuff that doesn't exist anymore. Taking screenshots and everything else, trying trying to make sure that, that nothing gets lost. And even so, it's still all digital. Yeah. Like until there's, it's not actually a paper trail, right? Like we u- are using the word paper trail, but, you know, if there's some sort of like electrical global catastrophe and like just the internet doesn't exist anymore, you know, that is lost. But you know, eventually we're going to fling into the sun. So nothing is actually (laughs) permanent. It's always good to have perspective. The Gutenberg parentheses is something that's really interesting to me that I've never um, thought of in that way. And I haven't ever heard of it. So I haven't had much time to chew on it. 
but the like the medium itself and like you said the hybridity between oral culture and s- static printed literate culture um i'm i'm immediately my brain is spinning on parallels between disinformation and misinformation cuz you know there's like a lot of that and like botting and astroturfing and those kinds of things that happen to try and create what feels like a fake upswell of support for something. Um, But I imagine that always happens. Yeah, I mean, propaganda has always existed in oral tradition and in literate. And I mean, the thing is, too, with the parentheses, it's not like a cold, hard, you know, it's not like folklore went away during the era of the printing press and, you know, in the pre-internet, post-Gutenberg time. Um, I think it's, and I'm not, I'm not sure what, like, what professional folklorists view uh, or like what their opinion of that theory is. Um, it may be controversial. I'm not sure. You know, I, um, I don't, again, I don't have a graduate degree in folklore, so I'm not really privy to the academic side as much. Uh, in terms of like what the contemporary academic opinions of these theories are. But I just find it a really interesting thing to think about, um, especially in terms of internet culture, like how it's shifting the way or the predominant way that we communicate with each other and how also how like so often folklore is viewed as this uh, this form that exists in antiquity when it really is very, very similar to uh, this incredibly modern means of communication. Yeah, that's um, something that we butted up against. Uh, our initiation into doing this entire project came from a place of total ignorance and then was like opening a door to the wonderful wide world of what folklore actually is. Because at least for me, I can't speak for Perry, but for me it was very much like, oh yeah, like creepy weird old stories. And it is not that. It's the stories people tell. And, you know, there's... um. Urban legends, for example, had a similar kind of process of realization around them where there was a a folklorist who was a professor at the University of Utah, I think. Um, His name is Jan Harald Brunvard, and uh, his parents were Norwegian, if you couldn't (laughs) tell by the name. I had a guess. Yeah. So Jan Harald Brunvard, who's still alive, uh, was teaching folklore. Uh, as a professor, and he started noticing something really interesting about the way that his students were talking about folklore, which is that they were discussing it in those same terms as like viewing it as these like weird old stories that had nothing to do with their lives. And then they were going back to their dorms and like whispering these tales of like hook handed men, like killing kids at lover's lane and like hitchhikers disappearing from back seats. And you know, when Jan heard these stories, he was like, you know, this sounds quite a bit like folklore. And so, and this was before the idea of the urban legend was a popular concept. And so what he did was he challenged his students to tell him every single one of these stories that they could think of. And he began cataloging them and he became the person who popularized the urban legend as a folkloric form and ended up writing. I have a ton of his books, but they're like, he has just like books and books and books filled with all these urban legends that he collected. I think his most well-known book is the, uh, this is called the vanishing hitchhiker. And it's, uh, like a academic text on urban legends. It's called American urban legends and their meanings, but, yeah, so he has piles of books. I mean, for the listeners, you can't see me right now, but I'm holding up like a fairly significant stack of chonky books. And this isn't even all the ones of his I have. Um, and yeah, so it's this idea of those moments of realization where you're like, wait a second, I'm a person right now. I'm a folk. <laughs> if yeah. I'm a folk, I must also have folklore. <laughs> Yeah. People who were telling these old stories were modern people when they were telling them. It's it's really easy to forget that and to look at it through, uh, you know, a, uh, a daguerreotype lens of like this was old times, uh, but it 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 wasn't when it was happening, which is obvious, but it it's not at the same time. Um, the other thing about that, too, is that I think a lot of people don't understand the importance of studying it. Like something that we've kind of stumbled into discovering is that there are play- like colleges that are losing or cutting their folklore programs due to lack of funding or just like a general lack of appreciation for it. Um, 
And so like one of the other things we wanted to do with this as we've like started learning more and more is to try and just make more people aware of the value of studying folklore. We'll be back with more of our interview with Jenna Rose Nethercott after this. Welcome back. Writing prompt in in a in a short way, can you describe the importance of studying folklore? Uh yeah, well, I guess on the one hand, I think that those cuts that we're seeing this is something we've seen throughout history is an undervaluing of folklore and it is 100% a class issue. Um folklore is the communication means of the working class. It is not controlled by the elite. It is controlled by the proletariat. And as uh, so, of course, elite institutions do not see the value in the, um, the wisdom and culture of the proletariat. Um, and that's been, you know, that's a tale as old as time. So it's, it's no surprise to me that that's always the first thing on the chopping block. Um, but in terms of the importance of it beyond just being a valuable, um, proletariat art form essentially is what I was talking about at the beginning of this episode, which is the idea that folklore is a mirror for a culture. And by studying your folk tales, you can learn what a community's values are, what a community's fears are, what their scientific understandings are, what their taboos are, what their belief systems are, the way that they treat each other and what those values are. Like anything you want to know about a culture, about a people, uh, you can learn by just looking at a fairy tale that they tell or, you know, a ghost story that their grandmother whispered to them in their kitchen. And it's, you know... It's more than just like a fanciful tale. It is the skeleton of people's lives, you know, and it's to discount folklore and the value of folklore is to discount the value of people's lives. Particularly because that's what people are keeping alive just by talking about and sharing. Exactly. Um, And again, it is they are reflections of who are doing the telling so if you say i mean and that's why folklore gets on the chopping block it's that classist thing where by saying we don't care about folklore you're saying we don't care about the people telling these stories and their lives and their values and their cultures it's amazing how pervasive uh class issues like that are in everything if you really if you step back and abstract it something that occurred to me before that i stuck a note down and forgot was um with the advent of the internet, and I, I, wa- I guess I want your opinion on this because it's like a half-formed thought that occurred to me, something that we get to do now because of the open nature of the majority of the internet is peek into other folk groups we don't necessarily belong to. Because like, whereas with oral tradition, you would have your family folk group, your friends, whatever communities or hobbies or job or whatever you're around. But now I can like, I can go look at, uh, I don't know, AI Twitter, which is, well, something as I'm tangentially interested in, but then you see all of the language and all of the community and then the culture and vibe around that. And I feel like that's inherently different about the internet. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's, there's pros and cons to this, right? Where it's, it's really exciting that for the first time you're able to have a really close knit communities with their own like sort of language and tenets and, um, belief systems that are not based on geographical location. Um, so it allows, you know, one of the things that I think is really lovely about like internet community is it allows for, for example, like a queer kid in like rural Mississippi to suddenly find other people and solidarity and community that they may not find, uh, in their geographical location. Um, so it allows for people to, you know, find their people. On the other hand, this is how QAnon happens, right? Where it it's a feedback loop that if you end up in the wrong ones, you get sucked in and suddenly like you're you always land at like blood label somehow. Right. I don't know right. how the f- every single conspiracy theory it always goes back to like, oh, it's the Jews. Right. I was now. gonna say it's all it's all goes back to anti-Semitism, which is like God, the the oldest thing. Well, and it's because that that first that that first real conspiracy text was an anti-Semitic text, and so all conspiracy 
uh, holes lead back to that original text. Yeah. Which is just very just exhausting. great. Yeah. Um, Truly just silly. And also, <laughs> I, I feel like with the weirdness of permutation that comes from uh, the incredible strangeness of internet culture it's very easy for people uh like particularly young people or isolated people to slip into these pipelines that lead them to these dangerous groups without consciously realizing that it's happening or even like dog whistles that go missed by people and then get spread through something else and become more popular um i don't have a and like that's how the incel community has come together. I mean, and I think that's the thing with folklore in general that is really worth discussing is it is often um, viewed not just as antiquated, but as very quaint and cute. Um, there's this like cottage core energy to the way that people view folklore. And that is sometimes true, but usually not you know and like like i've been talking about where folklore exists as a way for communities to talk about taboos or uh like really the uglier sides of reality but in a way that uh puts a veil over them that makes them seem innocuous uh folklore is not a cutesy innocuous thing it is fully a way to spread uh propaganda it is fully a way to spread uh, othering it's a way to brainwash and um you know it is how you end up with incels it is how you end up with QAnon, and it's all and it's always been that way this isn't a new internet thing you know like uh changelings are one i referenced earlier where in changeling folklore you will often see a Chain, like almost every changeling story, uh, if you listen closely to the descriptions of changelings and changeling folklore, which are, you know, for those unfamiliar, a changeling is in usually like a, a Scottish, Irish, English, like Celtic folklore. Uh, it's when the fairies steal your baby and replace it with a fairy baby. And your baby's been taken off to fairyland, and now you have this like fairy baby in your house, um, which looks a lot like your baby, but you can tell it's not quite the same. And yeah, if you look at descriptions of changeling children in traditional stories, they almost exactly mirror descriptions of common birth defects and congenital disorders. And so it was this way for parents with a a child with a birth defect uh, or a child who may be sickly in some way to say, oh, no, 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 this isn't my baby. This is a fairy baby. So on the one hand, you have this way of like, if a if a child is maybe passing away, for the parents to feel uh, more peace with that, that their child is actually somewhere safe. But you also have this insidious other side of that where changeling stories always end with how to get rid of the changeling and get your own baby back. And that involves putting the changeling in a fire or leaving the changeling at low tide and waiting for high tide to come in. And so it's essentially a socially acceptable form of infanticide fueled by this story that allows that heinous act to become acceptable. Um, and there've been court cases around this where people have committed, like there's a famous court case where a man convinced a whole town that his wife was a changeling and they killed her. And then in court, his argument was she was a changeling. Really? I had not heard of that. Yep. Yeah. I think it's in Scotland. Um, so, you know, folklore if you look at it on the surface, it is like pretty and whimsical. And that is its purpose. Its purpose is to take something that's too much to talk about without that whimsy and drape whimsy over it in a way to obscure it, both to allow people to address things, but also sometimes for harm. And, and we I very think, much see that in the internet. Yeah. And, and I think there's some inherent power to the way that our brains are wired when you attach ideology to narrative and community and identity um, where uh, to to go in, into that or into pipelines like towards maybe things that would you would at the start of them have thought you'd never would have believed um, people I feel like inherently we're, we're community creatures and as you start to fall into this community and get to know these people you feel an inherent desire to defend or uh, take on some of the aspects of things and what they what they believe in. And particularly when there's uh, stories that are pervasive and things like that, it really is an effective way to 
get into people's heads, I, I think. And it's like it feeds into itself, which I mean, that's one of the things about folklore and the folklore process that is so fascinating to me is that it's almost alive on its own. It is this breathing thing that has a way of surviving. Um, one of my favorite examples of um, internet culture and folklore uh, is this is so fucking bonkers to me is have you read that vice article about tulpamancy that came out a few years ago? No, but there was the tulpa theory around slender man, but uh, and I'm familiar with the concept of a tulpa, which is that feed in a, it's actually in our first episode um, that is not out yet. Uh, a creature that exists by feeding it attention. It, it exists by being served that mental energy. Yum, yum, eat them up. Uh, make me stronger. <laughs> like, Yeah. So, um, I am really obsessed with this one particular application of the tulpa in modern culture where, so tulpamancy originally was sort of a blend of like Buddhist mysticism and theosophy, um, where like sort of the idea that if you meditate enough on an imagined figure, and if you have enough people, like enough monks or theosophers, uh, meditating on uh, an imagined figure that you can manifest that figure. And so it it has this um this like older spiritual um origin, this idea and this word. And then uh internet furries found out about it and the furries started using the practice of tulpamancy in order to manifest their like furry alter egos who would then take over sort of their bodies and then they would go in chat rooms and the, talk to each other. So it's this amazing, to me, this is like the exact example of why folklore is so exciting to me in the way that it manages to survive in that it, this is a practice that started in this like Buddhist mysticism theosophy world. And in order to survive, it has adapted itself to applying to like furry chat rooms in the 2000s in a way right. that is just as potent. So it's almost like a, a being or like a virus, or, not a virus, because I, I don't I don't think it's negative, but like, it's, it's like a creature that's finding how it can survive in these different contexts. And um, yeah, and I just, I love that, that particular adaptation that feels so surprising, but actually kind of makes perfect sense. Yeah, it does. It's that, it's that recontextualizing and, and, and reuse. Uh, and with the advent of the internet, being able to learn about things like a tulpa or whatever, uh, very much easier. Cause that I can't imagine would be something it's hard to imagine life without the internet when you're someone who works from home and Googles everything all the time. Yeah. Uh, but like to find out about that, unless you had somehow had a brush with theosophy, uh, like, yeah, it is, it is so fascinating. I really um, recommend reading that Vice article about it. If you just Google like Vice Tulpas, it, it'll probably pop up, but it's really interesting. The internet's newest subculture is all about creating imaginary friends. Tulpamancy. Dope. I'm going to keep that tab open. Yeah. Um, it's a wild article. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it is interesting, right? How you, how you said that folklore is like this own third entity that is keeping itself alive and spreading and all these various aspects are. And it like feeds off our belief. Yeah. And there was in, uh, 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 Gina Jorgensen's book, Folklore 101. I'm going to paraphrase this horribly. Uh, she said something along the lines of like folklore is a way to have a look into the, like what is actually on people's minds and what they're keeping alive. And it's interesting how currently everything is such a conglomeration of older things and new things mashing up in this weird way. I, it's really hard to, I, I feel like it's hard to figure out what, what the internet is doing like if if the internet didn't exist, what would the study of folklore look like? What would our various folklores look like? How different would it really be? Um, because the speed is the obvious thing. And I mean, I think you can see that in the fact that folklore existed before the internet and people did study it. Um, so, yeah, one of the interesting things about um, that book I was referencing, the Brunvard book, uh, "The Vanishing Hitchhiker," is that the first edition of that book. 
uh, I think came out in the 80s. And so it is a study of urban legends, but before the internet, which, you know, urban legends are this very modern mode of folklore, but they're very much an 80s folklore. Most many urban legends are like really rooted in the 80s. And especially because the 80s were, uh, you know, the era of stranger danger, which right. is such an urban legend feeding fuel. Um, that, yeah, that's a good example of one where you can see what modern folklore looks like without the internet, um, but still ha having its contemporary energy behind it. When we, we had a chance to talk with Chelsea Weber Smith, I don't know if you're familiar with them, uh, the podcast American Hysteria, uh, which goes into moral panics, urban legends and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and one of the things that they brought up was the stranger danger, moral panic and how that manifested in different ways. And that Anybody was a really is? interesting one because that was a, that was a deliberately manufactured panic, um, where the authorities purposefully released false data about the number of children who go missing, um, oh, to deliberately that. freak everybody out. Yeah. No, it, they released a number that was like absolutely insane about the number of children who are uh, go missing. And, what they did was they released the number, including kids who ran away from home, as the same figure of kids who are kidnapped. And so the number they released was like tens of thousands, when in reality, it was this tiny, 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 tiny fraction of that. And most of the children in that data were kids who'd like run away from home and came home a couple of days later. Um, right. But it was enough to, you know, spark this moral panic. And the authorities didn't correct it because they deliberately wanted people to kind of, I don't know, it's, there's always a benefit to keeping people frightened, you know? Yeah. And, and keeping people fixated and focused on something other than the other actual problems that are affecting them. And that one in particular is interesting to try and think about like what they were distracting from. Cause one of the things that Chelsea brought up was like the issue of kids being harmed in their own home or not supported in their own home, because it's a lot easier to talk about uh, a big boogeyman as a stranger in a van coming to steal you than it is about generational trauma. And, and that's the like same that. strategy that folklore always takes, right? Is that it's, it creates a fictional monster so that we don't have to look directly at the real ones. Because the real monsters are, if we were to look the real monsters in the eyes, it would be unbearable. Right. But also, uh, are you familiar with monster theory? Oh, I don't think so. Oh, tell me. So that's, uh, that's in our, our first episode as well, because we talked with uh, Vivian Asimos, who introduced us to the concept and then gave a little brief on it. It's basically seven theses that describe monsters in the stories that we tell and then the different ways that they represent different things. Like one of them is the monster's body is a cultural body where the like the literal depiction of the monster has uh, a lot of cultural significance to it. Another one, the, the one we focused on the most that was interesting is about uh, monsters always representing the, uh, my brain is saying condescension. That's not the word uh, transgression of bear of uh, boundaries and categories. The monster is a harbinger of category crisis where it's always, yeah, like a vampire is breaking living and dead. Slender man's breaking reality and fiction. Yeah, there's an incredible essay by Theodora Goss about that same concept. Um, and so I I'm really obsessed with this idea, which is that what makes something monstrous is a contradiction within its own body. So it is not the thing itself we are afraid of, but it is this chafing. So yeah, the vampire is living and dead. The werewolf is animal and human. The witch as like feminine, but dangerous. Um, and these contradictions, these chafings are actually what causes that feeling of the uncanny. And this also connects back to an essay by Freud called The Uncanny. Have you ever read this? No. This piece is great. It's, you know, I, I, I like to take Freud with a grain of salt. Yeah. Freud, Freud can be a little bit. Yeah. But <laughs> he's, he's a vibe. Um, yeah. but this essay of his is really excellent. And I feel like as a writer too, it's like an amazing cheat code essentially for how to, um, manufacture a feeling of unease in a reader. And what he talks about is that the difference between horror and fantasy in fiction is that fantasy is a fantastical thing happening in a fantastical world. So we're not afraid of dragons, like dragons, we don't consider monsters because they exist in the context they're supposed to exist in. However, a monster or, or horror is a fantastical thing happening in our world. 
Um, and so with that thinking, it's not the thing itself we are afraid of. It is the concept of something existing in a context where it shouldn't. So once again, it's that chafing sensation, not the thing itself. So, you know, in a ghost story, you never hear a ghost story where all the characters are ghosts and they are in the world of the dead. What makes a ghost story frightening is an interaction between the living and the dead. So this chafing where it, these two things don't belong like a proximity that feels wrong. And it's the same with monsters where they embody that that chafing and that proximity. And that's what causes us to have this feeling of unease. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's interesting when you look at the ones that are more societally based and, and try and abstract away exactly what, like you said, which is being uh, a cross between femininity and being dangerous. Like, what does that fear mean? What is that? What is that pointing to? After the break, the conclusion of our interview with Jenna Rose Nethercott. Welcome back. The monsters, again, like that's how they provide this mirror and reflection of, of a culture and their fears and their biases is it shows you what a culture thinks doesn't belong next to each other. And, you know, with feminine and dangerous, that's a perfect reflection of like, you can tell that a culture thinks that women are supposed to occupy a certain space um, by what then is monstrous if they deviate from that um, and right. what those deviations mean about a community's values. But now we have the subreddit, witches versus patriarchy, and that's cool. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> uh, there is one thing that we have touched on a little bit, and it just occurred to me that we're actually doing a whole episode on it. Uh, well, we're not doing a whole episode on it, but we're using it as a springboard into uh, lighter topics. And that is man door, hand hook, car door, hook, hand, man. <laughs> Yay! Um, <laughs> what a man, hook, hand, man door he is. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. He can be described with the following words. That story, I don't know if you wanted to give a telling of it, because I think we could use some of the, the things we were talking about with monsters and things like that uh, and have, have you be in, in that one as well. Sure. <laughs> I love hook hand man door hook man. Um, so there's a number of hook men in urban legendry, but I believe the most famed of them all is a uh, one night a uh, a teenage couple are driving down the road and maybe they're coming from a party. Maybe they're coming from the prom. Maybe she's wearing a yellow dress. Maybe it's blue. I can't quite remember. In every telling, it changes. But uh, they're listening to the radio and they're flipping through the channels. Oh, here's a lovely song, but it's not quite lovely enough. So they flip the channel again and uh, the news is on. And on the news, they hear that, oh no, an escaped mental patient, homicidal maniac has fled from the institution and is on the loose. Uh, someone would like, a, here, do any of you have a good radio voice? I worked in radio for eight years. Local news reports a dangerous convict has escaped from the local mental asylum. Be on the lookout for a man roaming the streets with a hook for a hand. A hook for a hand? That sounds terrible. But this is no concern of ours. We're simply <laughs> driving along the road, having a lovely date in my beautiful pink chiffon dress. The car comes to a stop. They either run out of gas or perhaps the tire pops or perhaps they just pull over to the side of the road for a bit of youthful canoodling. And, um... Usually there's something wrong with the car because the boyfriend has to go get help. Either go walk down the road to the gas station and get some gas or walk to try and get a phone to call and get a tire change. And he tells the girlfriend, here, just wait in the car. I'll be back soon. Uh, we'll get the car up and running. Things will be fine. And so uh, she sits in the car and she waits and she waits and she waits and she waits. And it seems like she's been waiting an awfully long time, given uh, the length that this chore was supposed to take. And eventually she gets frustrated and she gets out of the car. And the mean meanwhile, OK, meanwhile, rewind. We hear uh, as she's in the car, she's there's this scratching on the roof, sort of the sound of like branches of a tree scratching, scratching, scratching on the roof of the car. And eventually she wonders where her boyfriend is. So she gets out to go looking for him. And when she turns around, she sees that the scratching on the roof was not a branch at all, but it was the tip of her boyfriend's nice, shiny dress shoes, scratch, scratch, scratching along the roof of the car as he has been hung from the tree above his head. 
And uh, in the door, there is left just a single hook stuck in the handle of the door. Now, in some versions of this story, the couple gets away and they drive home and they get back to their driveway and they successfully get out. And that's when they open the door and they find the hook lodged in the handle, a near miss, a gentle escape uh, from the claws of death. And uh, yeah, there's a number of other hook hand legends, uh, Cropsy or Copsy. I think it's, I, I can't remember Copsy. if there's an art. Copsy, Copsy is one of them, never... which is a an a Staten Island urban legend about oh. a hook handed escaped maniac that this is worth looking up because there ended up being an actual series of, basically he was like a summer camp legend where he was this hook handed maniac who escaped from this abandoned uh, mental institution um, and hid out in an old tuberculosis facility that was on Staten Island mm. and would steal children and drag them into the sewers underneath the tuberculosis facility. And it turns out during the same period of time that this urban legend was being circulated, there was an actual child serial killer hiding out in that same space um stealing children so it turned out like the staten island experience just in general (laughs) oh god (laughs) don't staten island don't be mad at us um (laughs) but yeah so it turned this was one of those rare instances where you know so often uh folklore or urban legendary has a seed of truth at its beginning and then it blows but this was uh the reverse i think where it was an urban legend that then actually became but it wasn't technically ostention because it wasn't deliberately acted out Although, is it still... That's a good question. Does ostension require intent? I don't know. Perry? I, I think it requires that to be the inspiration. So it would be like, did he go, oh, I've heard this thing, so I guess I should go do this and live here. Um, I, I don't, don't think that, that's what was yeah, happening. I don't think that, that was it. Um, it was Cropsy. I did just find an article. W- with the other variants of it, though, what do you think... Uh, what do you think the why is behind those? Why do you think that those urban legends kind of surfaced and got propagated in so many different variants? So with the hook hand legend, as well as many other really parallel urban legends to that, um, which are often these summer camp stories where it's morning kids. Uh, basically, it's it's ways to keep kids in line, right? And so many urban legends, so many folk tales in general are designed to keep people in line or to uh, encourage certain kinds of uh, cultural behavior. So, uh, you know, if you go back as far as like Kelpie legends, this is one I talk about a lot. Uh, I've talked about this in interviews before because I love them. But with Kelpies, which are these like beautiful, sexy, sexy horses that wander along the shoreline and offer young virgins a ride on the sexy horse. But if you go on a ride on this sexy horse, you fuse to its skin and are dragged into the sea and devoured. Um, and sometimes this sexy horse transformed into a very hot young man. Um, so, you know, obviously this was a way for m- parents to tell their daughters not to sleep around, but it was too taboo to say that directly. So instead they would say, you know, don't go sleep with this horse. Um, Beware the hot horse. Beware the hot horse. And so, you know, this has been happening forever is this way for adults to keep children from deviating. And with stories like the hook hand and these urban legends that are really rooted in this stranger danger that we talked about a moment ago, um, it, it was to keep kids from straying too far from home. Usually these hook-handed men were like lurking in abandoned buildings that may not be structurally sound, lurking in the woods where the kids could get lost or get hurt. Um, And so, you know, it's never enough to just say, don't go there. Um, But if you create a monster that will enforce and punish that transgression, you're much more likely to succeed. Uh, Also, something that's really worth noting in these kind of like monstrous punishing urban legend figures is that they very often uh, have physical deformities. And so it's this othering technique as well. You know, the hook handed man is someone who is missing a hand. Um, There are other camp urban legends who have like a terrible limp and that's how you know it's them. Uh, There's this real uh, sort of emphasis on othering people with physical disabilities as something dangerous and frightening. 
which I think is very telling, again, in terms of the yeah. values of the communities telling these stories. And upsetting. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, to me, this is what's exciting about folklore is it's, it's almost it's to find the 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 ugliness beneath the shininess i guess mm. um is really fascinating to me because like you said before that's what it's trying to cloak in whimsy exactly, exactly. and and that's also like especially as an american so much of our culture is about romanticizing harm um mm. so much of the way that we address our history is romanticizing harm and there's something very um, very narratively fascinating to me about something that is both beautiful and harmful simultaneously. And the fact that those are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Like this is why one of my favorite places in the world is Coney Island, because at Coney Island, on the one hand, you're like looking at this beautiful Ferris wheel. You're like holding a cotton candy. And then you like look down and there's like a bloody rubber glove on the ground at your feet. <laughs> It's that same chafing, that same juxtaposition that causes the uncanny, that invents a monster. Um, and the fact that those things are not paradoxical, but in fact feed into each other and rely on each other in order to exist and continue. Yeah, it's a, 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 a an unholy symbiosis uh, that, yeah. I forgot Coney Island was a thing. until. Yeah. Just, oh, man, uh, it's so great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> That has a this, whole fascinating history, too, in terms of um, Coney Island in the Victorian era being started as a place where people could safely indulge in sexual deviancy. Uh, really? Look it up. It's a whole thing. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I can't get that. into it now. It's a whole story. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we've kept you for a really long time, and I know that you probably need to go. Um, is there anything that is going on in your life now or with uh, the production of Lore? that you want to let people know about? I'm on tour with Thistlefoot right now. In uh, the first half of January, I'm going to be driving all the way up the California coast with a puppet show in tow, animating chapters from the novel. It's pretty fun and uh, whimsical, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Uh, but also there's like a lynching in it. So it's the combination of uh, using whimsy to discuss things that are actually sort of challenging and painful. Um, I, uh, as I said, am a researcher for the podcast Lore by Aaron Mankey, which is a really fun folklore podcast. You should check it out if you haven't heard it. Some of my favorite episodes that I personally have researched are, uh, I wish I could remember the, the titles of the episodes, but uh, there's one that is on talismans and specifically the use of talismans in world war one among fighter pilots uh lucky charms that fighter pilots used in order to sort of steal themselves for battle and then there's one that i did that i really love on willow the wisps which are ghost lights that appear uh in in every culture and the descriptions of them are very similar um what was another of my favorites um, well, some of my favorite episodes that I didn't work on that were before my time, the very first episode of Lore ever seven years ago is about uh, the New England vampire hysteria and Mercy Brown, which is one of my favorite examples of folklore affecting history. Uh, if you don't yeah. know about the New England vampire craze, it's really, really wild and definitely worth listening to that episode. Um yeah, check it out. We're doing all sorts of cool work and we're doing a bunch of different shows through Grim and Mild, which is uh, Aaron Mankey's production company. And all of them are like weird, cool folklore podcasts. So, uh, yeah, we have a really sweet team of folks doing some real cursed sleuthing on the daily. So <laughs> I love that. Um, all right. Uh, I know you're about out of battery and probably about out of voice as well. So I'll hit stop on this. I'm out of food. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks to Jenna Rose Nethercott for spending time with us. You can check the show notes for links to Jenna Rose's books, her website, and social media information. If you like what you heard and you want to hear more of our interview with Jenna Rose, you can head over to Patreon for an additional 40 minutes of Jenna Rose awesomeness. And if you like this format and you want us to do it more regularly, just let us know. 
you can reach us at hello at eighthlayermedia.com. Digital Folklore is created and produced by Eighth Layer Media and is distributed by Realm. Thanks for listening.